Okay, so I wanted to talk, so you can see my screen, I presume, can you? We can, we can indeed. Okay, that's perfect. Thanks, Mary. So thanks very much uh, for the opportunity to present today. And I know we had two speakers on problem-based learning in uh, the previous session, but mine again is around problem-based learning in an online environment. So I do hope I'll be able to give different angles maybe to, to what the others talked about. And I suppose uh, Chris alluded to this, that in the medical school, um, there is problem-based learning. It is run, you know, totally within GEMS. And that's what Claire was talking about. So that's your big team teaching. I am more like what Chris was talking about, where I am doing this as a, a lone person with uh, two PhD students supporting me. Um, but it's I've been doing problem-based learning for the last probably 10 years. And when everything went to online, my kind of panic was, oh, am I going to be able to do this online? But we've, uh, I don't know if we said we muddled through. No, we got through. We, I think we got through very well, actually, uh, through the whole thing. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about my experiences and uh, how, how I found uh, the whole thing. So um, I teach problem-based learning in three modules, actually. So software quality, professional issues in computing and software requirements engineering. And um, as I say, I've been teaching it for, for that length of time. Um, I would have uh, done quite a bit of work with uh, Yvonne Delaney in the Chemi Business School and with Tom Cosgrove. So uh, Yvonne was uh, still is doing her PhD on problem-based learning and Tom uh, leads the civil engineering degree, which is on problem-based learning. And I must say from the first day I really heard about it, it, it I really liked it. And why did I like it? I suppose because if I look at the modules I teach, um, there's a lot of things around concepts and theories and documentation. And I suppose thinking about it as a good example is around the whole area of regulation. And, you know, we have heard a lot about regulation now with COVID and vaccines and all of that. So people know a lot more about regulation now than they knew 12 months ago. And what's very interesting is that in the software world, regulation is also very important. Um, if we are developing medical devices, for example, they have to be regulated. If we are developing for automotive, for finance, they all have to be regulated. And, you know, there is nothing more boring than trying to go through a list of regulations to students. Now, I'm, I'm not so bad that I would have done that. But at the same time, you still had to go in and summarize. And it was very cumbersome. I found it very boring. The students found it very boring. And I really felt I needed a new way of teaching and the students needed a new way of learning. So um, I suppose what Claire was talking about was probably more on the, the pure PBL side. And Chris definitely mentioned about how, um, you know, in, in pure PBL, there's no lectures or, or whatever that, that you let people work on their problems. So a bit like Chris, I think I do a little bit more of a mix. So how does it work for me? So I have, uh, it's me with two PhD students for support. Two of the modules I do are with masters and grad dip classes. So they actually are only double hour lectures in the other module one hour tutorial per student um, is, is held so I give a group problem at the start of the semester uh, weeks two or three I do within that double lecture which is why I like the double lecture is that we actually have maybe 20 minutes of lecture material an hour of group work and about 20 minutes of a lecture. So opening and closing with lecture and doing the group work. Um, I'm the facilitator. I'm the one who's going in, uh, trying to understand what the students are doing, what direction they're taking, can I steer them in different directions? And for me, I really find that this is research-led teaching. So I'm very much able to pull from my research background and my research work to bring that teaching into the classroom. And I think that's Maybe that's part as well why why it works, why I like it as well, because I really am giving them up to date things from from the work we're doing and others are doing in, in the software world. And yet it's allowing them to go and explore the problems and to understand them. I generally bring in a guest lecturer. This is one thing I suppose we missed a little bit during uh, the the online se sessions in that I would bring in a guest lecturer and allow a very interactive uh, session, which is very difficult to have in the online. And um, again, I think it was Chris mentioned about doing the, the reflections. So mine do a reflective journal. They do a final submission at the end of the semester in a group. 
they do a presentation mid-semester. Um, Chris, I'm picking up on lots of your points. I don't know if you're there, but you actually mentioned that you do a midpoint check-in. And I was thinking, this is my midpoint check-in where they do the, the presentation and they have to keep minutes of each meeting. So just talk a little bit more detail. In the reflective journal, um, I expect them to give lecture summaries. So they, it's 500 words they have to do each week and they uh, give a lecture summary. They write a summary about a paper and I just threw up the Google Scholar screenshot there. I literally, you know, pull down 10 papers, say, here's reading you can do, pick any one paper out of this and read. But I also expect them to give me something about their participation in the group project and how they're getting on. So it's it's very much about them really thinking about um, how am I participating and me being able to look at that and to discuss that. So what's what's way do we do the problems? So in uh, software quality module, I have a YouTube video. I mean, I vary it, but it, it can be quite, you know, over two or three years, probably quite similar. Um, and I ask them to develop a software quality plan showing how software should be developed for a clinical situation. And they're sent away and they're told to do that. And they don't even know what a software quality plan is at that point. Second module, professional issues in computing. We have a discussion in class about professions, and then they're asked to come back to me at the end with a conference paper discussing software engineering as a profession. And again, um, I am giving maybe lectures around ethics and around um, ethical codes that they have to have around green IT, for example, around the equality laws, all of the things that we need to think about as professionals. And the third group, uh, I. Last year, I found a newspaper article on the vaccine management system, and they were asked to go away and write up requirements specification for the vaccine management system. Again, not knowing what a requirement specification was, they were just told to go do this. And it, it sounds great that you just send them off, but you really have to direct, you really have to facilitate. So this just is the actual slide from the, their uh, requirement for the professional issues. Your task is to write a research paper for 35%. Those developing software for commercial or public use should have a professional qualification. You can argue for or against or present both sides of the argument. So I didn't mind what way they, they went, but they had to come up with a final, this is uh, where we sit on this uh, topic. And they needed to prepare it as a submission to a particular conference. So that meant that you know, things like referencing, as mentioned earlier, um, you know, quite strict within conferences, how the layout is done, the number of words, the format. So that's what they were actually given to do. So they were sent away and asked, asked to do this. So what was different for me in the online situation? So first of all, I use Solace and Big Blue Button. That's what I used. Um, the So suddenly I was in a room where I couldn't see anybody and they they could see me. We didn't use cameras or microphones. Again, it gets back to that equality discussion that we uh, has been happening earlier. Uh, some students didn't have. If they turned on cameras, they weren't going to be able to hear me properly. Uh, didn't have microphones. So, um, you know, we, we didn't use those. Um, questions were mainly done through chat. So I had my presentation, my chat, my participants all up on the screen. I was watching that. And sometimes if, if there were questions, I might ask the student to come in and talk if they had their microphone. So it was very much like I, I very much found it very black hole, you know, trying to get interaction going. The other interesting thing was, you know, with international student involvement. So at any lecture, I could have students in China, in India and in Ireland. And um, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, but I recorded the lectures and they were able to view them afterwards in any case. One of the issues I found really was around the setting up of groups. Um, you know, the, do you actually, and this is one that we debate all the time, do we actually create the groups or do we let them self-select the groups? And they found because they, some of them didn't know each other, grad dips, master's classes, had never met each other, had never been in rooms together. Um, how do you set up the groups? So there was a bit of discussion around that with um, classes who already have been together for a while. They know who they want and don't want to work with. And a lot of the times the body language can tell you all this. So I found that quite maybe stressful is the word. How do I set up the groups? How do I make this work? 
Um, and then the other thing was around the breakout rooms, um, limited numbers of breakout rooms, but we, we managed it. Now, my classes would be relatively small, so eight breakout rooms kind of worked. It, it didn't work totally, but it, it worked more or less for the, the groups. And I would hop around the breakout rooms. So, you know, the, it, it presented new challenges to me. So I really found it was very difficult for me to get to know the students, for the students to know each other. And with groups never meeting face to face, it was very difficult. But interestingly, in some of the reflective journals, you know, the students pointed out that this was the only class where they actually got to meet the people in their classes because there were so many classes that were lectures and lectures only. Um, so there was that said, that's just your two minute notice two minutes thank you yes so uh, definitely there was a lack of casual discussion um, I sometimes found the length of time in the breakout room you're trying to gauge how long will we need today that was difficult oftentimes in the main room I would say you know be with a group and they would have something to discuss and we'd stand up and discuss it among everybody and that I found very difficult so I kept having to ensure the questions were brought back and discussed with the wider group and it was difficult to monitor the individual prop uh, involvement in the group because in the norm I'd be walking around with see who was doing that so did it work I would say yes it worked but face to face definitely worked better the students solved the problems we got some really excellent output um, they, they met other students I've mentioned that the other thing I think with their online presentations they were less nervous than normal so their online presentations this year every single student were just quite amazingly good um, the reflective journals show how the participation group and one student in his, his uh, reflective journal said this was very fun learning. Um, you know, I've done some problem based learning publications in, in the early days when I've been working on it, but I've also published with students on topics and we're actually in the middle of a publication at the moment with third years and diploma students. So I've just got two quotes I want to show. So this was CS student this year. The problem based learning approach to the project also allowed me to learn about the topic through discussion and problem solving. In my opinion, I found this approach to be much more effective than the standard learning approaches. Now, I would say about this type of common is that because I'm the only one teaching them in the problem-based learning space, it's so new to them, it's so different, that actually is an advantage. And for the professional issues module, if I think, because I think that I know that one student has come back with this comment, I think this has been a success. We seriously all need to get together in the computer society, at least, and make more of an effort towards completely abolishing racism and sexism in the workplace. And I don't think I could have gotten that across to students in a lecture. They found that themselves. And I think to me that that really says an awful lot about how problem based learning has worked for me. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Rita, and talk about being.